Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. My name is Ryan and welcome to Central Park. As things start to slightly return to normal, we realize it still is a little difficult for a lot of people to travel around. So we want to continue bringing virtual programs to you by offering you the park virtually. We do have a bunch of different programs like 45 minute long virtual programs, as well as our shorter 15 minute informal weekly walks. Thank you for joining us today for a weekly walk, a very spring-filled one as we adventure through the Shakespeare Garden. We're gonna to be together for about 15 to 20 minutes and all the photos you're gonna see were taken by myself here in Central Park over this past week. We'll see a few other photos which I accessed through various databases like the New York City Parks Department, the Central Park Conservancy and the New York Historical Society uh, Digital Archives. I am a member of the Central Park Conservancy, maybe familiar with us. We help to keep the park looking clean and green. And our mission here at the Central Park Conservancy is to preserve and celebrate Central Park as a sanctuary from the pace and pressures of city life, enhancing the enjoyment and well being of all. Before we begin, a little bit of housekeeping. If you do want to say hello, please use the chat feature. I like reading over where everybody's joining us from people from Long Island, different parts of the city guests from Ohio, got people from Delaware, shout out to Delaware, I love it down there, and guests from all over the world, like in London and various other countries. Thank you so much for joining us. If you do have a question throughout the walk, please use the Q&A feature, and my colleague Juan will be on the back end answering any questions you might have. Uh, you last thing you'll see pop up are gonna be some visitor polls that'll launch throughout the walk, allowing everybody to vote, and then we can share the results after. Let's jump right into our walk because we got a lot to see, even though we're covering a small landscape, the Shakespeare Garden. Shakespeare Garden is about a four acre garden located or nestled right along the mid area of Central Park near the west side, right at about 80th Street or 79th Street in Central Park West, close by to some other features like Belvedere Castle and the Delacorte Theater, which we'll see in a little bit. We'll talk about why this is called Shakespeare Garden and how it's got its name as we take our walk today. But we're going to begin starting down at West 77th and 8th Avenue, covering a little bit of ground before we get to Shakespeare Garden. As we start our walk on West 77th Street, Central Park West, we're entering the park at Natural Estate. And as we walk in on Natural Estate, we get to walk over the 77th Street Arch. Coming over this way and taking a glance over to our left, seeing, of course, the park filling in with a lot of green color and people starting to use it more than ever. As we make our way down the path, we're going to cross the road up here, of course, keeping an eye on traffic as we do. And right as we come across the path, we're already greeted by a bunch of different blooms. As you can imagine, visiting a garden today, once we get there, as well as on the way, we'll see a lot of beautiful spring blooms. Here we'll see a native flower growing in New York which is known as Golden Alexander. There's a lot of beauty to be seen, whether it be in the park and gardens or even walking around in New York or any city for that matter. I do just wanna launch a quick generic poll, see where you prefer to see flowers. Of course, you can see blooms anywhere, whether it be the gardens like Shakespeare Garden or Conservatory Garden, as well as various areas in the woods where you might see Golden Alexanders, different types of water blooming plants, and even along city streets. As we continue up, we'll make our way to some more flowers. But as we continue, we can take a glance over our right, passing over yet another bridge or arch in Central Park, this one known as Balcony Bridge, giving us a little taste of the lake, the water body located right around about 72nd Street up to about 78th or 79th Street. And looking over, we can get a little taste of the water, as well as a visitor to the lake who stops by during this time. We zoom in a little bit, we can see who that visitor is. It's a great egret, a heron-like bird, which tends to inhabit all of these different water bodies over the summer months, adding a little bit of excitement and a where's Waldo aspect to some of these lakes. As we wave goodbye to our great egret pal, we'll make our way up closer to Shakespeare Garden. As we continue up the path, we're walking along a road that's traditionally used for running and bicycling today. But we can see it starts to get a little bit more rustic as we get these wooden fences coming, along, coming up along our right-hand side. As we walk along these wooden fences, they lead us to some more whimsical structures like the Swedish cottage, which we can see existing in the back of this picture. The Swedish cottage is actually from Sweden. 
It was sent over for the 1876 Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia, basically like a World's Fair. We would see the following year in 1877, it coming over to Central Park and being reconstructed to really serve a nice little whimsical piece of architecture here in the park. A lot of people may know it today as being the home of the Swedish, Swedish Marionette Theater Organization, a group that was started in 1939 and eventually would find a home here in 1947. We'd see in 1973, a permanent theater being created for this group to continue. And they're actually the oldest consecutively operating theater group of its kind here in the United States. Of course, they are a little delayed with the whole COVID in terms of opening up and continuing plays. But if you do check on the public theater organizations page, you can find out when plays are gonna be continuing. Of course, we can still admire the beauty of this historical building from the outside. You can also remember the deep history it holds because before this became used for the Swedish Marionette Theater Group, it was actually an entomology lab, which is basically a bug and insect type of gallery, almost like the Natural History Museum in a way. And we can also remember some of the people that worked in there, like this gentleman named Edward, Edmund Bronk Southwick. He was a New York City Parks entomologist, and he's actually the reason we have Shakespeare Garden today. Originally starting a garden in 1912 in this same area, it was known as the Garden of the Heart. And Bronk, being a big Shakespeare fan, planted four flower beds that featured flowers from Shakespeare plays and poems, used as a learning tool and area for kids to explore wildlife, learn a little bit about literature, and enjoy the beauty of Central Park. We wouldn't see it becoming known as Shakespeare, Gar Shakespeare Garden until about four years later. But thanks to Bronk, we see in 1912 the formation of this garden occurring. Learn a little bit more about Shakespeare Garden in just a bit, but as we snap back to present day time, we can see the entrance or one of the entrances of this beautiful garden. We're not gonna enter just yet, and we're actually gonna wrap around to the left because this garden actually makes up a few different pathways and walking around it, we can enjoy the beauty as well. Walking along this more northwestern face of it, we can see some of the densely packed shrubs. And as we walk a little bit further, we can see just how hilly of a landscape this is. This four acre garden being in an area where you wouldn't typically suspect a garden to be. But as we make our way up, we can still see beautiful different blooms like these Spanish bluebells, offering a nice little color, kind of a purple or almost blue hint, depending on which area you look at and where the sun's hitting but offering a little bit of color as we stroll up the way. We can also see some plants that aren't blooming just yet, but are filling in this wall of green. Plants like quince are used on these different bamboo type of posts to allow this viney shrub to grow up and create a wall of green, almost encapsulating us in this little pathway. You can also notice how wild of a growth this is. English gardens are known for their almost wild, sort of out of uh, untamed type of growth as we can see the plants just hanging over the fences here. As we continue up a little bit, we can also spot something just through those fences. One of the about 10 plaques you'll find throughout the Shakespeare Garden, which actually have quotes of Shakespeare mentioning plants, like this one, which says, I know a bank where on the wild thyme blows, where ox lips and the hotting violet grows. White over canopied with lush woodbine, with sweet musk roses and with elegantine. You can find a few of these plaques around, and this garden, of course, Shakespeare Garden, gets its name from really a lot of different plants featured in Shakespeare poems and plays, eventually earning its name Shakespeare Garden in 1916 to celebrate the tricentennial of Shakespeare's death. As we continue up, it's only appropriate we see a Shakespeare quote and then come up to the Delacorte Theater, which famously today houses Shakespeare in the park. Being constructed in 1962, this has welcomed hundreds of thousands of visitors over its um, existence since 1962, offering free Shakespeare plays. The first production actually ever done in 1962 when it was open was The Merchant of Venice. This is another area that will be returning as things come back to normalcy and we'll start to see Shakespeare in the park being performed yet again. As we continue past the Delacorte Theater, we'll make our way up coming into the heart of Shakespeare Garden, which again was once called a, heart, a garden of the heart. 
So we make our way up the path. We can admire how this garden is really built on top of a rock or a little cliff. Coming up this staircase gives us perfect example of how rustic of an area this actually is. As we make our way up the staircase, I will share those results for the polls. And no surprise, a lot of people like to see flowers in the garden. Well, you're in luck because of course we're getting into Shakespeare Garden. We're gonna see quite a few blooms popping up along the way. I like how a lot of people like to see them along the streets of the city though too, because that's a spot where we definitely need some fresh blooms in our life. As we come up to this little alcove area, we can wrap around coming in. And as we come into this little private sort of nestled off area, we can get a view down on the path we just walked up, seeing just how hilly and how elevated this, uh, this area actually is. As we turn our attention behind us, we can see a bench that is honoring a Parks Commissioner, Charles B. Stover. Charles B. Stover was a Parks Commissioner from about 1910 to 1913. He was influential in a few different things. He did co-found uh, the Outdoor Recreation League around 1898, which would go on to open some of the first playgrounds in New York. He was very instrumental in getting recreation and play space added to New York. And we do see this bench uh, being placed here because Charles B. Stover was also an avid Shakespeare fan. So it's only right this memorial was placed here, and he was very influential in helping Bronk create this garden. Again, eventually receiving its name Shakespeare Garden in 1916, honoring the tricentennial of Shakespeare's death. But this Charles B. Stover bench, which was placed here in 1936, offers a wonderful memorial and tribute to Charles B. Stover, that New York City Parks Commissioner. This granite bench is in the shape of an excedra, which also holds another secret, it transports the passage of sound in a really cool way. If somebody's uh, to go into one corner and whisper something and another person puts their ear in the other, the sound will travel along the back, almost like those kind of walkie talkie cups with a string that you may have used as a child. But a really cool device known as an excedra and a really fun thing to try if you ever make your way to Shakespeare Garden. As we exit this little alcove area, we're gonna get into the heart of the garden. You can see it's a little confusing on the map. But that's because there's only about a path or two to follow. So walking through the garden will not take us too long, but we can enjoy the beauty as we go. Coming out of this little alcove and getting a little view up towards the east, which is facing the Belvedere Castle Plaza. Another beautiful area that features another two smaller gardens or lawns that are actually part of Shakespeare Garden. As we make our way to the right though, heading a little southwest down this path, we're gonna come up on our right to one of the about two or three entrances or exits in Shakespeare Garden. Of course, looking very full and grown in today, we can reflect on what this area did look like back in the 1900s. This photo coming from the New York Historical Society and showing of course about 1913, 1914 in the early years of Shakespeare Garden back when it was known as the Garden of the Heart. Seeing those plantings, of course, being a little bit more modest to today's overgrowth, but certainly enjoying the change, like the fences becoming more rustic, and those dirt paths being transformed into a stone path. We do wanna watch our uh, step as we go along because it can be a little bit uneven, but that's for the better. We can take our time slowly meandering through these paths that wind us to the left, and then back over to the right. A lot of twists and turns in this small path, but a lot of beauty to see as we go. Keeping our eye out for some of those various plaques, as well as other little blooms we can admire. And as we come around the way, we can see some different blooms like these flowering quints, which can be found all throughout the garden. You can also see some other more hidden architecture, like this sundial. This sundial was created around 1945. It's by a sculptor, Walter Beretta. Not too much information available on this sundial, but it is a fun ancient sundial to see here in the park. It can also sometimes actually be used to accurately tell the time, depending the time of day you come here. If you don't take into account daylight savings, and if you get it when the sun is actually in the one spot that actually allows for light to pass through. But of course, a fun feature to see regardless of its functionality. As we make our way past that, we'll come to our last stop or two here in the garden. As we make our way down, we come around another winding path and come up to what is arguably, in my opinion, 
the best area to sit here in the park. Uh, well, best area to sit here in Shakespeare Garden, I should say. This is a great area to read or maybe even to write. And I actually want to launch a poll that's kind of a sort of random one, but one that I always find a little interesting. Central Park, of course, and all parks really inspire us a lot, whether it be artistically, maybe more of a writing or literature basis, but certainly whatever you're passionate about, you can find inspiration in parks. And since we're in a garden that is certainly influenced by Shakespeare, we can also see influence from other artists like Walter Scott having a statue in the park, as well as Robert Burns. There's certainly a lot of literature inspiration here, as well as a lot of literary characters. So just a simple one, have you ever written or read literature in Central Park? Or maybe even has the park ever inspired you to create something? Doesn't have to be literature, it could be a painting, it could be, it could be really anything, maybe a picture, photography. There's a number of different things we can find inspiration in the park. This spot though always gives me inspiration because looking over here, you'll see what I think are the coolest flowers in Shakespeare Garden. These are called alliums, A-L-L-I-U-M. And alliums remind me of giant dandelions, even though these are better known as giant onions. Looking a little bit closer, we can see some of the beautiful detail of these, again, almost dandelion looking types of flowers. They have such beauty. If we zoom in just once more, we can see how many flowers are actually tightly knit together in these really cool long stalks that will grow two or even three feet tall. A really fun flower to see, these giant onions. As we continue along, we can see plenty of other little beautiful blooms as well, like these kamas. I believe these might be giant kamas as well as they're growing and rivaling uh, size with some of these giant onions we're seeing. But as we come around the path, we can start to admire some of the detail a little bit closer on, as well as just be blown away by all the different colors and flowers here. No matter the season, you'll find something blooming in Central Park and gardens like Shakespeare Garden aren't any different. But as we come around, we'll get overwhelmed with a lot of the color. And then we'll get a little break with some of the different greens and shrubs that we see existing through here. As we make our way down, we can admire one more flower before we wrap up our walk. These being a type of clematis. I'm not sure if it's a large flowered clematis. I'm not too good with my flowers, but they're beautiful nonetheless, especially as we come in a little bit closer, seeing some that have yet to bloom and some that are kind of reaching their end point. But we can certainly see that they're enjoyed by both us as well as plenty of pollinators. Various types of butterflies are returning to the park, various types of birds, as well as a, very, a bunch of different types of bees, like this little honeybee, which is hugging on to this clematis flower and certainly doing a great job of producing more flowers by pollinating things all throughout the park. We do come to our final little point here in Shakespeare Garden, a small landscape, but one that's felt very large as we've taken our time walking around and to this area. Shakespeare Garden will end with this little view overlooking a very historical area, the Swedish cottage, which we learned a little bit about before, an area that really led to the creation of this garden with Edmund Bronk working in that entomology lab and being inspired by some of Shakespeare's work to create this educational garden out here. One that originally was again called the Garden of the Heart, but eventually would be renamed in 1916 Shakespeare Garden, celebrating the life and the tricentennial of Shakespeare's death. But a really fun little four acre garden to visit. And with that, we will come to the end of our walk. But I do want to just share that simple poll result real quick. And not too many people maybe have read or written, but I can understand why, because my eyes are always focused up, whether it be in the tops of the trees for birds or looking down at some of the flowers. It's always nice to look up left, down, right, and all around because you never know what you're gonna see. So even if you have uh, read or written in the park, certainly important to stop every now and then and take a look at the beautiful surroundings we have. I wanna thank everybody so much for joining us as well as voting in some of these polls. But again, we have plenty of ways to stay involved in the park and we're gonna continue doing virtual offerings like these weekly walks. We do have next Wednesday, a uh, Memorial Day weekly walk themed walk with me 
So if you want to learn a little bit about some memorial themed history here in Central Park, you can join us next Wednesday at 1230. If you want to learn about some of the military history and some of the really cool um, forts that exist in the north end of Central Park, we do have a Northern Forts virtual tour on May 25th, as well as another virtual spring tree walk happening on May 27th. And for those that are a little bit fed up with virtual tours, don't worry, we are returning to in-person tours. Starting Memorial Day weekend, we will see in-person tours commencing and rolling out. If you do check the chat boxes, you can find the links for some of these virtual programs, as well as for in-person tours. So we hope to see you both virtually and in person as we continue bringing the park to you. But thank you so much for joining us. I am going to leave this open for another few minutes in case there are any questions we can answer. But we hope to see you soon. And thank you so much for joining us. So from all of us here at the Central Park Conservancy, stay safe, be well, and we'll see you soon.